following COVID and the economic changes that have happened around the world, broadcasters have less cash coming in. What are the cuts that are being made? Do you reduce spend or make programmes? That doesn't seem like a very good idea. Businesses are no longer focused on subscriber numbers. They've all said that they're focusing on profitability. In order to stay on air, we think... Can we still invest in the technology that is needed for the future? And how can businesses remain profitable as we go through this change? Welcome to Today, I'm here to discuss those challenges and predictions with a man who has a gaze on the present and a vision of the future. He is a siphon of broadcast knowledge and a walk-in media encyclopedia. He is a head of media futures and innovation at BT Media and Broadcast and also chair of the UK section of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. That was a mouthful. You may also know him as the BT Tower Tour Guide. It's John Ellerton. <laughs> Welcome to my podcast. You're on the first episode. So Thank you, Luke. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes from here. Right, so let's just get straight to it then. How exactly is the cost of living crisis making a significant impact on the broadcast industry? Okay, so yeah, it's quite interesting um, looking at the industry now in the current economic circumstance uh, following... COVID and following um, the economic changes that have happened around the world, what seems to be happening is broadcasters, like a lot of organisations, have less cash coming in and are having to pay their staff more. So there is fundamentally uh, a cash crunch in the organisation. Yeah. Uh, the media industry, of course, is, is a complex thing because there are many levers. A lot of companies make revenue by selling subscriptions to consumers and consumers in COVID got quite excited about what we call direct-to-consumer platforms, things like um, Disney Plus and Netflix and so forth. And now the cash in their pockets has reduced then cancelling those subscriptions has been yeah. an obvious thing to do. I mean, of course, because everyone had so much time on their hands, right? That's right. And yep. yeah, there was a we all a watched lots, lots of telly because we didn't have anything else yeah. to do. Exactly, that's right. But now it's well, now there's less cash to go around. Then that's one of the first things you cancel. But then also organisations who make their revenue by selling ad space, like a lot of uh, the commercial broadcasters, are finding that it's harder to sell that ad space because the companies who buy the ad space themselves have less money to go around. So staff need to be paid, and the cost of living has gone up. You know, the, the whole the whole economic situation means that it's much harder to fund a media outlet in the first place. What are the cuts that are being made across the board? So there's a crunch in the middle. And what do you what do you reduce spend on? Do you reduce spend on making programmes? That doesn't seem like a very good idea because yeah. your audience will walk somewhere else. Or do you reduce spend on infrastructure? Well, maybe if you can. And we as an industry, are in the middle of an enormous transition from traditional kit, traditional ways of working, to organisations that look more like IT enterprises with the promise of having a much more efficient way of doing things. But that transformation isn't free. I guess it's like the transformation to have new you know, new technology will ultimately make it more cost-efficient in the future, but that yep. upfront investment is huge and you've got all this legacy kit. What do you do with it in the meantime, That's right. right? That's right. And the, the BBC has a, an expression for this. They call it tech debt. You know, they've, they've mm. bought all of this stuff and um, they've agreed with finance in their organisation to depreciate it over a certain amount of time. But if they if they need to replace it sooner than that, well, you know, there's a kind of technology debt there. So um, there's a there's a bit of a this feels like a bit of a trap in the sense that organisations need to transform, um, they need to cut costs, but they haven't got capital with which to pay for this technology transformation. And so uh, I, I've I've been to a number of conferences recently. The most illuminating in this particular context was the DPP leaders briefing where lots of organisations were saying the same kind of things. Uh, the public service broadcasters were talking about needing to do more with less. The commercial broadcasters, it was quite interesting hearing people like
like Sky and Comcast and um, Paramount talking about joining forces in terms of engineering on a global basis. So rather yeah. than um, the different Sky organizations and Comcast in the US having different engineering um, methods and different engineering teams to, to unify globally um, in order to pursue much more efficiency um, while still maintaining the individual presence in each of the individual markets so different programs in different markets and that's how that makes a lot of sense i guess ultimately you want your content to be different but how you get that made doesn't necessarily have to be different that's right that's right um and so i think particularly now in these days where content creation can be cloud-centric to a certain extent then actually the tools that these organizations use can be more globally held perhaps than was previously the case because now they're not putting equipment in specific locations to make programs for specific outlets it can be a common uh, a common set of infrastructure held in uh, in cloud and then just deployed in the different regions depending upon where the programs need to be made what would be a sensible pragmatic approach to moving towards an end-to-end all ip solution well it rather depends where you're starting from of course um so there's this great dream of being able to do lots of physical hardware and transforming that into um infrastructure that sits on servers and maybe sits on cloud um, and where we're able to use automation far more than before to be able to drive these processes, which means that you don't need to have lots of people uh, building infrastructure. You don't need to have lots of um, uh, engineers maintaining stuff necessarily. And importantly, it means that you can spin up infrastructure and spin it down again when you need it, rather than necessarily having lots of stuff sitting around. But the problem of capital means that investing in all of this is going to take longer. And so I think what I think we'd all hoped is that by now we'd be seeing a massive transformation of a lot of these organisations and where a broadcaster is replacing a studio um, that they'd be building using SIMT 2110. But that's just not happening. I'm hearing a lot of broadcasters talking about, certainly for smaller studios, still continuing to go out and buy SDI matrices to build the core infrastructure with because it's much lower cost, it's very pragmatic, you can build it and get it working very quickly. So it's a bit sad in a way that we've got this grand vision for a much more efficient way of working, but there's a tremendous sense of pragmatism in the industry at the moment. I think people are building what's needed to keep the show on the road um, with the ultimate vision of transforming, but I think that might take a bit longer. And so in terms of cuts, it's not necessarily doing less, it's trying to keep going um, without necessarily realising the, the vision of being able to transform to, to this, this future-looking um, uh, enterprise that, uh, that we all aspire to. Baby steps, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah, good, good enough steps. Good mm. enough steps. But, of course, the, the consequence of that, then, is um, the, this vision of being able to make um, more and better television of being able to uh, have everything as high dynamic range uh, that might take a bit longer to get to perhaps um, so yeah it's um, it's it's making the best of what you've got many organizations many media organizations have already gone a long way down the road of turning their organization into an IT centric organization in episodic production because shooting content and storing it in a media asset management system and then editing it and you know seeing seeing the day's rushes and then being able to comment on and, and all all of that 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 whole kind of production workflow that is file based it's still complex to transition to an in, to an efficient workflow automation driven system but it's nowhere near as complex as doing that with live mm. and and the reason i make that point is that really that's where medium broadcast has traditionally been 
in the industry, our part of the industry is live because that's the hardest thing of all to do, right? To to get um, live content from where the action's happening to the consumer without breaking it in the process, um, without taking it off air in the process is is very challenging indeed. So to transform that part of the workflow into an entirely IT-based organisation is also pretty challenging because what we're talking about is trying to maintain the very low latency performance and very high availability performance of an end-to-end chain such that you can get pictures from the camera in the stadium or wherever the action is happening to the consumer in a very small number of seconds, ideally less than that, in a way that is entirely using IT-based infrastructure and thinking, that's very challenging indeed. So a lot of media organisations, as I say, have started with the scripting and the scheduling end of the organisation and have, have made good strides in turning that into an IT-centric workflow. And then episodic production... It involves a lot of storage, of course, but getting the rushes up into the public cloud and being able to um, view and and ultimately edit there is is doable. It involves investment, but it's doable. The the interesting part for us is the finished programs, scheduling those and playing them out or creating VOD assets and reformatting them such that they can be fed to the consumer and then getting those downstream and out to the consumer through um, through coding and packaging systems, through CDNs and so on and so forth. If you start from nothing, like, you know, like a company like DAZN did, for example, if you start yep. as, a, uh, as a streamer, then it's much more straightforward to get to a completely end-to-end IT-centric operation and you can pursue a lot of workflow efficiency in doing that. If you start as a broadcaster, you've got lots of um, broadcaster thinking that needs to be overturned. And and actually, in a lot of ways, it, it's the classic business transformation problem. In a lot of ways, it's not about the technology. It's actually about the people. It's about the way that people think. It's about the way that teams of people work together. It's It's all of the organizational processes and procedures that need to be transformed as well as the technology. One of the things that Medium Broadcast has been thinking about is how can we help the industry on this journey to transform from a traditional broadcast workflow into a more IT-centric workflow? And fundamentally, we are part of a big telecommunications company that has invested vast swathes of money in transforming itself from being an old-fashioned telco into being a modern Um, telecommunications company for the 21st century. So BT has thrown away um, a a lot of very old infrastructure and thinking and transformed itself into a far more efficient organisation that's much more software-centric. We we have teams of engineers that understand cloud intimately and how to build in the cloud. I think one of the messages that we want to convey is if you're trying to transform whole areas of your business, focus on what's important in terms of your people transformation and trust us to provide technology systems as a service to you uh, on an outsourced basis because we can deliver things like play-out systems as a service end-to-end that will fit into your broadcast organisation without you needing to go through that technology transformation. We can provide systems like um, encoding and multiplexing entirely virtualized, which gives flexibility to your business without you needing to go through that technology transformation or the integration headaches that that creates in doing so. I mean, does it just go back to the old saying, it's like you can try to do one thing and master it and do it well, or try to do everything and do it Indeed. average. Indeed, yeah. Um, do yeah. Do what you need to do. Outsource the things that actually other people can do can do for you and do for you very well. So so look, a lot of this stuff is quite 
is quite experimental really we we've got some great capabilities we've got some great customers who've trusted us with a lot of these capabilities and the things that we're delivering for them you know the the d34 uh, encoding and multiplexing uh, contract is a very very good example of that some of these things work very well for org- for some organizations they don't work for all organizations and so it's trying to work out what's the best fit but medium broadcast is uh, an organization that um works in partnership with our customers and we fit our solutions to the way that your organization works um, it's not a kind of one size fits all so so i think as we all walk along this journey together towards a much more it centric um, industry um, what we're trying to do is to be uh, is to be a partner to our uh, our broadcast customers our media customers to provide technology as services um, that fit well into your workflows and your your broadcast infrastructure. Talking about streaming, the investment in streaming we know is huge. You know, Netflix notoriously has spent billions on on their content. Uh, how profitable streaming businesses are is sure. is I guess up for debate, right? But we're now seeing the price of streaming services; they're going up. As you said earlier, people are cancelling their sub- streaming subscriptions. Free ad-supported streaming is being positioned as an alternative option yep. to to those who can't afford to pay for one, two, five yep. sure. streaming services. Yep. Do people even want free streaming? This is really interesting, and it's, and it's fascinating watching the dynamic in the market. So the thing that we refer to as fast free ad-supported streaming TV um, has become enormously popular in the US. And there's a good reason for that. American consumers, uh, for many, many years, got most of their television from cable. And the cable companies had a very dominant position in um, in feeding uh, TV channels to the American consumer through the cable TV networks. But more and more consumers in the US um, realized that actually they could get the TV that they wanted through these paid-for streaming services like Netflix. And so what happened during COVID is that many of them subscribed to um, not one, not two, not three, but maybe four or even five of these paid-for streaming services and realised that they have more than enough telly by those means. Mm. So they cut the cord, as it's known. They stopped paying their cable subscriptions. And then they realised that they'd not only lost the premier channels that they used to pay money for on the cable networks, they'd also lost access to all of the other channels, all of the home shopping channels, all of the Christmas TV channels, and all of the other stuff that people do enjoy watching, You know, that, that people don't want to just watch the premier stuff the whole time. There came a demand for free TV in addition to the, uh, the subscription TV. And so that's where um, companies like Samsung and Roku started to create this bouquet of free-to-air channels through their TV set, through their streaming sticks. So now if you go into um, an American um, retailer and buy yourself a new Samsung or TCL uh, TV set, take it home, turn it on, plug it into your internet connection you'll find a thousand channels of TV for nothing. And you can scroll, you can scroll through using the, um, the remote and watch all of these channels. And in amongst them, of course, there, there may be subscription channels as well. So there's now an enormous industry in creating these free-to-air channels. And um, there are several suppliers out there like Amagi who have um, built a business on um, creating channels with ads that are served specifically to each consumer, um, mm-hmm. so it's a uh, dynamic ad insertion, um, and it's making money. Each, each channel on its own isn't making a lot of money, but together, it's you know there's there's quite a lot of revenue in here. Flick to the other side of the Atlantic, and the situation in Europe and the UK is a bit different yeah. because we've got public service broadcasters and we've got regulation which ensures prominence of those broadcasters' channels and our TV sets. 
So if you turn on your conventional TV, you know, press the button one, you'll get BBC One in the UK and so on and so forth. So the place for free-to-air TV, in addition to the public service broadcaster channels, is there's less space in the market for those things here. Mm. It's not to say that there's no space far from it. And you know, if you think about the Sky EPG, um, there are a lot of free channels there that you don't have to pay for. So there's clearly a demand for free channels. So I think, you know, in answer to your question, is there is there a demand? Yes, there absolutely is. People do want free TV. And as you say, as people stop paying for many subscription bundles, then actually having the opportunity to get some of some of those channels with ads in, there's clearly demand for that and and more. So this is all a bit of an experiment really. Um it's going to become a lot more real in the UK and in Europe as more and more consumers start to turn off um, conventional TV and start streaming only. And that's one of the big things that the media bill that's going through Parliament at the moment is trying to address, such that the public service broadcasters' channels will re- retain prominence, even if you're only uh, receiving the channels uh, over the internet to your TV set rather than rather than over the airwaves. Yeah. I guess it, it you know it's it's interesting when you talk to different people they have different opinions on this. I mean, for me, I'm I'm so used to watching content on streaming services. I'm in a position where I can pay for those, so I don't have a problem, but I remember you know at one point I signed up to YouTube Premium. I don't know when. Mm. Um got used to never watching any ads on all the videos and then when I accidentally switched over to the our BT Media and Broadcast YouTube channel, which didn't have YouTube Premium set up, and then I, I watched a few videos and those ads played, couldn't couldn't deal yeah. with it. It infuriated me. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting what you get used what, to what 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 people what yeah. people get used to and what they'd be willing to pay for to not have ads. Is targeted advertising a way that could maybe alleviate some of those frustrations? Maybe to where it's not just talking about everything that's not relevant to you whatsoever. Maybe, yes. And we've all experienced the thing of, um, you know, watching um, one of these streaming services in the evening and there's just endless gambling ads, you know. <laughs> uh, and and so, so, yeah, if there are targeted ads that are relevant to me and, and it's not constantly gambling, it's it's advertising stuff that I might be interested in, well, yeah. that does sound like a benefit, doesn't it? Um uh, and and I think the broadcasters are, are are kind of constantly walking this tightrope of trying to make as much money out of ad spots, yeah. but not irritating the consumer so much that they feel compelled to switch over to something else. Uh, again, referring to the American market, you know, as a European watching TV, watching conventional TV in the states, where you know you you have the 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 opening credits to a show and then it crashes to an ad break and then you come out again <laughs> into, the, into the first yeah. five minutes and then it crashes to another ad break. I, that's really kind of, um, kind of stunning, really. Um, quite jarring, let's say. Um, well, I guess it's th- if they're just used to it. But that's right? what they're used to. And and so when Netflix appeared in the States, I think it was amazing for everybody to have <laughs> to be able to watch a program all the way through without ad breaks. So, you know, as, as you say, you, you pay your money and you take your choice, really, as a consumer, um, what um, uh, what you are prepared to put up with, you know, if if, if it's free. And people yeah. are prepared to put up with a bit more. The only thing I don't want, right, with targeted advertising, and this happens when you go on the, in, you know, you search something on the internet. So, say I need a new toilet seat, and I've searched this on the internet. Yeah, I've gone through Amazon or on Google or wherever it is. I've bought my toilet seat now. I, why are you sending me for the next three weeks Haunted loads of toilet, toilet seats? Seat How many toilet yeah, seats do you think I need? Yeah. So I hope, however the technology gets developed, yeah. It's somehow able to be smarter. Yeah. That it no- kind of knows what you actually need when you need it. Yeah. How yes. that works, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, that's the uh, the science behind um, ad serving, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's funny me saying that as a marketer. I I, I like serving ads. I just don't <laughs> like receiving them. <laughs> I think we're all like that. Aren't yeah. We? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How does this cost squeeze and what we're going through in the economy right now? change the type of content that's being created across the board for for streaming live tv or even what goes into cinemas 
it's it's interesting, isn't it, looking at the kind of content that's being produced. I think um, one of the things that struck me just recently is how many more uh, shiny floor show um, uh, game shows there are on TV. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's great. It's cheap TV. You know, it doesn't cost very much to make. It's very entertaining and people enjoy watching it. Well, that, that's on YouTube as well. Um, if you look at, like, all the big YouTubers, like Mr. Beast or, or even the Sidemen, like big groups, mm-hmm. they'll just buy these warehouses. They can get two-hour pieces of content. They could probably record for six hours all in the same location, yeah. do these little game shows that are quite cheap to make, and yeah. it gets millions of views. So yeah. uh, it makes yeah. sense from that point of view. So, yeah. so you could call it innovation. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's... In some regards, for the broadcasters, is returning back to the kind of big shows that were made in the seventies, where shooting in a studio was really the most cost-effective way of doing things, rather than taking a film crew out on location. Um, and you know, uh, it, it's still entertaining telly, and so it's making the best of what you've got, keeping the keeping a lid on the costs, and, and and constantly innovating, constantly serving audiences with things that they haven't seen for a while, and that's cool. I was at the um, SVG Future Tech conference yesterday and one of the things that was being talked about was uh, about how the rise of um, social and streaming consumption of sport. Because it wasn't that long ago that the primary outlet for sport, sport TV at least, was the live show on a Saturday afternoon You know when the sport's being played and that's where everybody used to gather around and that itself, of course, hasn't changed. But what has changed is the way that uh, people consume sport at other times. So rather than you know, reading the results in the newspaper, <laughs> which is what they might have done 30 years ago, now people are maybe sitting down in the evening and, and watching a few clips and watching some slightly longer form things about, about what's coming up, about the games that have just happened, uh, watching the pundits talking about things. So... Reuse, extending the ad revenue opportunities through this as well. How do you watch your content? Because I just generally use, I just watch the highlights videos and maybe some like analysis. Yeah, I, I commute to work on the train, and so I, you know, watch all the stuff on my on my phone on the on the way in and back. Mm. Um, but then at home, oh, it's interesting actually. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, I was a single bloke for a long time, and um, uh, what I. I just consumed stuff on Netflix and um, you know, a couple of the other streaming services, and BBC iPlayer and things like that. And I remember there were there were high winds in the UK. Um, you know, what would that be? Four, three or four years ago. And it turns out that the terrestrial antenna and the satellite dish had blown off the roof of the small apartment building that I live in. I didn't know. I, hadn't noticed at all. It was only when I saw my neighbour picking the bits out of the car yeah. park that I that I realised it, it had come off through. So, uh, but then I, I got married uh, uh, nearly three years ago now, and my wife likes watching uh, conventional TV. She reached for the normal TV remote, whereas I don't. I just been using the Apple TV remote um, and started watching normal TV. Um, and so there is this kind of combination in our household now of 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 regular broadcast TV as well as um, on-demand streaming TV. But we do enjoy using the big TV in, li- in the living room for, you know, for the um, watching it, watching stuff together and, and for the, you know, the, the big screen viewing experience. Yeah, I, I always defend the big screen viewing experience. I, I can't stand people who are watching like a movie or something on their mobile device. Yeah. It just infuriates me, but that's just me. Yeah. I think similar, similar to that, I... Yeah, when someone asks me where's the aerial, I'm like, oh, uh, I've no idea. I haven't plugged it in. I don't know where it is. <laughs> when I moved into my flat, so yeah, yeah. I had an interesting conversation with somebody yesterday who was talking about who's a broadcast engineer who was talking about um, having a house in in a fairly remote location in the UK. I'm not sure where it was, and he was saying that um, now the broadcast transmitter that used to serve his house um, has. Uh, long distance Wi-Fi antennas on it, so that his cottage um, is able to receive uh, high performance internet uh, over a microwave link. Um, and so he took down his terrestrial TV antenna from the uh, chimney pot on the, the roof of his house and put up a microwave receiver. So ironically, he's now watching streaming TV, um, 
transmitted from the same transmitter tower and received on the, you know, mounted on the same chimney stack um, that his old um, uh, well, analog or digital TV transmitter and receiver used to work on. So it's the same same infrastructure, but it's now completely streaming based. One of my observations when it comes to what we see in film, they're generally really huge, big blockbuster budget films yeah. that are less risky, and that's because they're either based on you know pre existing source material or it's got like a big name director attached. Companies will make ultimately what is going to be the most profitable and we've seen how that changes what goes in cinema i think it's a shame when you see certain content that you love or, or more like risky diverse content that you just don't seem to see anymore because you see all these less risky blockbuster films yeah but then that's what people pay the money to go see so that that's what they're going to continue making and then we've seen when they do make something more risky that will just get moved to streaming so there's there's specific places where content's being housed now where it traditionally might have been somewhere else. The expectations for high quality content, whether that's film or television, is so high. And you know, we talked about the different ways that broadcasters and production companies are trying to make more, you know, cheaper content. Is there a concern that if we continue to make less risky or just cheaper content that people might start tuning out? Of, of of course, and I mean, look, you, you and I work in the, the the technical end of the industry, so we're really just kind of commentators on <laughs> uh, on on the content end of the industry. But clearly, there's a tightrope that's walked here by the the commissioning editors and by those who are buying content uh, for for media outlets. You want to create stuff or buy stuff which is original and interesting and um, builds the the brand of your channel or your outlet but by the same token you you need to keep the cash rolling through the door and and so these things do tend to ebb and flow don't they one of the things that i think a lot of people in the industry feared when the silicon valley companies got involved in media um, so the likes of amazon and netflix and so forth yeah. was that their massive budgets would just um, suck all of the resources out of the industry and um, they would be the ones with the best content only. And that's happened here and there, but it's definitely not an exclusive thing. Mm. There's still a lot of great movie content, there's a great. There's still a lot of great TV content which is being made by, um, by other studios, um, a lot of it funded, of course, by uh, by governments around the world. You know, you need to need to look at the credits on uh, a lot of movies to see, you know, the Canadian government or the French government or the Australian government funds um, are, are are helping um, filmmakers to to make great content, and and so I think every everybody wins in a situation like that. You know, the the lo- the country where the 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 movie is made benefits in terms of visibility their um their local talent benefits um but also we end up with uh, with more diverse and, and great content so that's that's one solution that, that i that i observe quite a lot looking at the credits on movies and on tv programs actually um but then i think the other interesting thing that's happening in in these days of streaming is um pe- because of subtitles People are becoming more accepting of foreign language yeah, content, yeah. and I mean uh, the the Walter Presents uh, series on um, on Channel Four is a great example of this. Um, you know, I remember was it Deutschland eighty three that was an um, that was an amazing series that was only in German but subbed into English, and I think that showed a lot of people just how much amazing content there is out there which English language audiences have barely seen before. And that's really cool. So, so, I, so I think... Um, it's like if you're struggling to find something to watch, just switch language and then find right. the top 20 things that came out. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So much. So, so, from. so, so yeah, the, you're right that streaming and um, you know, the thing that we used to call user-generated content um, has increased the volume of content massively. 
and trying to find decent content of course is uh, it's a classic problem that everybody has you know the thing yeah. of sitting in front of netflix and taking longer choosing the piece of content than it actually takes you to watch it um but i but i think there is decent content out there there is decent content that's that's still being uh, commissioned and made now one of the values of a public service broadcaster or a good commercial broadcaster is scheduling content so that people get fed stuff that they wouldn't necessarily choose themselves. And th- th- but the algorithm would know they want to watch well, that or they'd th- like it. But this is the thing. And um, th- I was having a very interesting conversation with somebody at the BBC yesterday uh, about this. The value of a scheduler on a broadcast channel by comparison with the algorithm on YouTube or you know whatever your favourite streaming outlet is, the art of scheduling is picking content which is attractive enough to your audience but keeps them on their toes by feeding them stuff that they wouldn't necessarily have expected. Yeah. And, and that's where audiences can be shown things that actually they wouldn't have otherwise watched. And it's an amazing thing. Whereas, of course, the risk with um, an algorithm-fed streaming service is, as we see with TikTok and the like, it feeds people what they are most likely to want to watch. And so you might say that their interests get narrower and narrower and narrower rather than I'll, being broadened. I'll give this example again, and it's similar to the toilet seat situation. It's like, okay, I watched Too Hot to Handle on Netflix, but that doesn't mean I want to watch 20 different yep. dating reality shows. That's like, right. can you stop flooding my feed, please? Yeah. And this yeah. is where this is where you get into all the domestic arguments with like, are you on my profile? Because the algorithm's just feeding me all this genre right. of content. That's right. So, so um, I, I think there is there is a definite art here, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with you know, AI driven, uh, automated scheduling and so forth. Whether um, we can train AI to do something similar to what schedulers have classically done, but it's it's very much an art, and I think human driven scheduling um, for 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 the main outlets is going to be here for quite a long time to come. I think you've led me on nicely to my next topic, which is AI. <laughs> Can artificial intelligence make a significant impact in saving money in the short term, not just the long term, or is this right now just another? buzzword that everyone's kind of talking about AI but they don't necessarily know what to do with it I mean you know even my nan's talking about AI my dog's talking about AI everyone's talking about AI right so I'm getting so bored of people talking about AI because nobody understands what it is but let's not let's not dwell too much on it because otherwise I'm just adding to the problem (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're literally part of the problem exactly that's right (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna put that bit in one of the things that I I love um, referring to whenever I talk about new technologies is the Gartner hype cycle (laughs) google it it's it's in, in conversations like this it's very it's very useful because what it talks about is um a new technology emerges Lots of venture capital is thrown into it and it gets more and more popular and um, people start talking more and more about it. The press becomes aware of it. The press starts talking about it to um, uh, you know, the, the man in the street, as it were. And and then, as you say, even your nan's talking about whatever it is. And today... It's, we never talk about technology. Why are we talking to, about this now? <laughs> to, today it's AI. Two years ago it was blockchain um and you know before that I mean, it that, was that cloud tra- that transcends any topic like um bitcoin was just all the all that's the right. crazes that's just right everyone that's right and then and then, and then and then everybody was buying these flipping nfts these um electronic yep. monkeys that are worth nothing now <laughs> well so that's a good in a good illustration of the next stage on the gartner hype cycle so you go up to the peak of inflated expectations and then everybody realizes that actually it's whatever it is, whatever this thing is, isn't that exciting after all. And it, it crashes right down into what's gloriously known as the trough of disillusionment. 
And that's where we're at with um, NFTs at the moment, okay, okay. With, with, with blockchain and all of the things around it. But on AI, we're up. Right now with AI, we are at the... Peak of inflated expectations. So, so what happened? So, so you go up to the peak of inflated expectations. You crash down to the trough of disillusionment, and then some time passes where companies then start making use of the, whatever the technology is, and you end up in the plateau of productivity, where where things, are, where, where whatever it is, is being well used, and it's probably baked into your iPhone, or it's uh, or whatever the technology is 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 powering the websites that you're using day to day, but you're probably not aware of it. So AI is being talked about a lot at the moment, and the reason is um, the arrival of generative AI. Um, and when generative AI was um, was launched to the public a few months ago, a lot of people logged on and had a play with it and um, saw the the way that this enormous the potential this, I guess. The, 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 this large language model uh, as you know, whichever one you use but the large language model is able to take a body of information and reuse that information in a way that you um, tell it to to create something novel for you only it's not that novel because it's based on everything that it had before unless you ask it to do something which is based on something it doesn't know, in which case it tries to bridge the gap, and that's where this concept of hallucination comes in, where it's, it, it, it creates something that it thinks you want, even if it doesn't actually know, uh, have the information upon which to base that thing. So, your question was, can AI save us money in the short term? Look, it depends what, what you mean by AI in that context. Before everybody started talking about generative AI... The thing that people um, referred to as AI uh, was probably actually more accurately described as machine learning. Um, machine learning being simply a way of um, training a machine to be able to do something well based on based on repetition. And so there are some good examples here of how uh, machine learning has helped organizations in the media industry. Um, some of the best examples are in news, actually. If you've got a great big news archive of news stories and stills and video clips, the only way to actually pull anything out of that archive was to rely on the metadata associated with the pieces in the archive, so the descriptive data on each of those pieces. Mm -hmm. And you'd have a database that would search for those tags and would surface the pieces according to the tags. But of course, the usefulness of the tags, well, they're only as useful as the tags that were actually added to the material when it was put into the database. And if you're a busy journalist and you uh, do a, you do a, a, an item on a particular celebrity or member of the royal family or whatever, and you have, you have the photographer take a few snaps and you do your piece... And then at the end of the day, you file it in the archive. You'll probably add a few metadata tags onto it to just describe what was there, and then you forget about it. The trouble is, a photo of um, Prince Charles taken at Sandringham is fine, but it would, but it's nowhere near as useful as a photo of Prince Charles doing something or with somebody else at Sandringham in a particular you situation. You never know what you're going to need it for when exactly. you put in those right. of descriptions. And so so the thing that's become very useful in, in with AI, being able to give AI access to a great big media library, is it's able to read all the text, analyse all the pictures and create keywords, watch all of the frames of video and create keywords so that when you're searching for something, if you then use generative AI and you say to the generative AI engine, um, show me some pictures or show me some footage of Prince Charles at Sandringham on a rainy Thursday, bosh, it can feed it to you immediately. That's useful. That saves a vast amount of time as you put the content into the archive in the first place it saves even more time 
um, rushing around, trying, watching hours of video material, trying to find the right shot because it surfaces the right thing. So I think that's quite a good example. Another good example is um, content clipping for uh, for social and for streaming. So um, let's say you're broadcasting a season of uh, football matches and you want to be able to reuse that content um, during the week between the matches. Um, you could set your editors uh, and your junior staff loose on tagging all the content, clipping it all up, um, adding metadata, adding descriptors to all yep. the players and all of that kind of stuff. It'll take you hours, hours and hours and hours. But if you set an AI engine loose on it, it can, and, and you tell it what to look for in terms of what, what a good clip constitutes, it will recognise the faces, it will add descriptive tags to everything, it will then clip the content up in such a way that you get things that are interesting to the audience and very rapidly you can get stuff which is usable um, with very minimal human oversight mm. you still want to check it before you send it out but with very minimal human oversight uh, you can create assets that are then uh, as we were saying before will bring you more ad revenue in because you're able to to reuse the content on different outlets and it'll bring audiences to your main programs because they know what's coming and they you know that they, they know what's what's good you're also simultaneously being told you should modernize your business you should move to the cloud what's the right thing to do right now yeah it's it, it this is quite a conundrum and different organizations are, are doing it in different ways i think the thing about broadcast skills is is very interesting there is a group of engineers who all entered the industry, what, 30 years ago now, who are the core group of engineers who, un- who really understand how broadcast works. They, they built the facilities. Yeah. They, um, they're now mostly engineering managers or engineering directors who, uh, who intimately understand how it all works. They are, many of them are retraining and reskilling in order to understand how software works, how the cloud works, how to, you know, how to use things like Terraform to be able to instantiate um, Docker containers in the cloud and all of these wonderful things. But at the same time, we look at school leavers and we look at people going through university and they look at the media industry through very different eyes. They don't see television as something exciting in the same way as the engineers 30 years ago did. They see television as only one part of the much bigger media industry. And so what they would aspire to join is a media industry that has its future in many, many distribution methods, be it streaming, be it social, be it cinema, be it traditional television and they see an an industry that uses IT skills and is heading towards being an entirely IT centric organisation so they look at what they should be studying in order to get into technology more broadly and they end up studying software, they end up studying maybe computer science And they find themselves on a path into the IT industry proper, which offers them quite a lot of money, particularly once they start looking at at cloud companies and so forth. So the challenge we've got as an industry is to excite those uh, youngsters who don't really understand what happens behind the camera. And that's the reason for the Rise Up Academy, which... um, both Media and Broadcast and Simpty UK who, uh, that I run, uh, we're, we're both of those organisations are strong supporters of Rise Up and the Rise Up Academy because we recognise the need to get into schools and excite children about television and about the making of video media. And we need to then ensure that those children 
choose university courses that will keep them on track heading towards our industry and then as they graduate that we encourage them to come and join our organizations and so ideally many of them will end up working for production companies and systems integrators and broadcasters so that we then have a future talent pool who can make use of all of these wonderful new AI assisted tools to be able to continue to deliver great content to uh, to UK consumers and let's face it make great content that Britain can export around the world because the film industry the the t- the, the creative industries are a big part of British exports so so that's why um, as head of Simpty UK I'm trying to build and grow connections to universities that are teaching media technology. I'm running events to connect um, students with uh, employers and to, to try to kind of funnel these these really bright, intelligent people into these organisations. And so bringing it back full circle again, it means then that organisations, broadcasters, who've got these groups of um, senior engineering staff now who are trying to um, reskill and retrain themselves into the the modern world of, uh, of IT based and software based systems can draw upon the resources of these bright young minds who don't know any different and they don't know they can't do it and that's exciting when you bring those two things together. Going into the new year, what organisation... Well, we are in the new year now, as the time of this uh, video <laughs> releasing. Um, now we're in 2024. <laughs> yes, yes, we're in 2024, definitely, right now. Um, what organisations do you think are going to be the most disruptive? Well, it, this is this is a very interesting time, as ever. Um, I suppose we always say that in the media industry, don't we? It's a very interesting time. Yeah. It's interesting watching the rise of YouTube and... The under-20, let's say, audience has now grown up with YouTube as the default place to get content, Um, even though, of course, TikTok is the place that they endlessly scroll through. But um, if they're they're watching media, it's probably on YouTube. At the DPP leaders' briefing uh, a week or so ago, YouTube stood up and said that they intend to come for the living room. In other words, they're focusing their business now on their next area of growth, which is to feed content to the television set in the living room. Hmm. Um, And that's that's very interesting from the perspective of the rest of the media industry because they've already got the audience, they've already got the connections with the, um, the, the, the young audience, they've got a lot of relationships, um, and so, well, let's face it, the next frontier, if you like, for the living room is when I turn on my new television set, do I pick the channels or the content from the electronic program guide, from the the user interface that the manufacturer presents me? And that's what they would want, of course. You know, Samsung and TCL and, and everybody wants to be in control of what I consume because they can make money out of that? Or will the audience just immediately select YouTube because that's where they're used to going and that's where all the content is? And if they do that, then actually the revenues will mostly go to Google. And Is that a good thing? Well, it's certainly an interesting competitive situation, isn't it? Mm. So... That's definitely one to watch to see how successful they are. Um, and it, this comes back to the whole um, battle for prominence, which in the UK, the media bill is intended to try to influence, try to try to protect. Um, but this battle is going to be fought out around the world over the course of the coming years as the, the rights holders, the studios, the TV set manufacturers, the box manufacturers, the operating system manufacturers and the portals all kind of fight one another for for prominence. If you were to 
condense that whole conversation into three suggestions, your top three suggestions on how businesses can remain profitable. So this is this is an interesting time and um, businesses are no longer focused on um, subscriber numbers. They've all said that they're focusing on profitability and because that's how they're going to need to survive the coming few years, the coming cash, the, the, the cash crunch that everybody's experiencing. In order to stay on air, in order to keep transforming, we think relying on capable outsource service providers like media and broadcast is a good way of doing that um, rather than spending all your resources trying to transform your own organization entirely into an it centric organization uh, outsource what you can to an organization that um, has has the, re- the required it capabilities but is also um, secure and um, can can provide you with the right kind of uh, levels of integration and, uh, and and understanding of your business. So that's that's one area. We've also talked about skills, and I think there's um, still a real concern about organisations um, recruiting and training up and retaining uh, young talent. So invest time and energy in uh, in reaching the the schools in reaching the universities and work with us on trying to bring the right people in to continue to build our, our industry um, and and I think the third thing that we've talked about is making great telly um, and you know even though the the cash to spend on investing may not be as high as it was a few years ago um, continuing to make compelling telly even if it's cheap cheaply made telly (laughs) surprise the audiences because we love it as long as it's engaging yeah that's right great so that's the end of this episode then thank you for being my first guest for this (laughs) mini series Um, We've got a few more episodes lined up, so make sure to check them out. We'll be releasing them every other week on a Friday. So stay tuned for more. That's a wrap. Goodbye. Goodbye.